Good morning. I want to welcome you and thank you on behalf of the Schmidt family for being here today. Your presence today is a way, it's an expression of your love and care for this family. Thank you. Would you join me in prayer as we begin, as we begin our time together? Father God, I want to come to you this morning and I want to thank you for you being here. Thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you that you are the God, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. And Father, I pray you would pour out your comfort, your grace, your kindness on this family today in this time of loss. Thank you for being that foundation that we can stand on today and for being there to hold us when we just need an arm around us. So we love you, God. May you be honored in everything that's done here in this place today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when I think of Pastor Bill in particular, a verse comes to my mind. A verse he quoted many times when he was the pastor here, and it's Hebrews 11:6. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You know, I want you, as we start today, to grab onto two thoughts by faith. We can't see them. But two thoughts I want you to grab onto. God is here for you today, and tomorrow, and every day for the rest of your life and for eternity. God is here for you. And Jesus said, surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Grab onto that thought by faith today. And secondly, I want you to grab onto the thought of the great hope of the return of Jesus Christ and of eternal life. We can't, we can't see it but we can grasp it by faith. Jesus promised, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, what did he say he will do? <laughs> I will come back and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So I pray you'd be comforted and encouraged by those words as we begin today. God is here for you, and we have a great hope of eternal life with him. Okay. With that, I would like you to join me in a song this morning. It's going to be on the screen for you, but I'm going to get a hymn book. because I can. It's What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Um, would you like to stand with me for this song? Let's, let's stand. What, what a Friend We Have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in
precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take it. wasn't easy. <laughs> Bear with me. I need to relax a little bit. Everybody okay? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. It, do you all have a program? If you don't, I'm Neil Schmidt. I'm the youngest of Bill and Lena, dad and mom, whatever you want to call them. I'll be giving the eulogy this morning. Obituary for Wilbur, as you most of you knew him, it was Bill, his middle name Lee, and Lena Irene Schmidt. Former pastor and local Christian bookstore owner, Wilbur Lee Schmidt, Bill, went peacefully to be with the Lord and Savior on April 9th, 2020 at 1.45 p.m. in the home of one of his daughters in Dallas. He was surrounded by his wife, Lena Irene, of 70 plus years, and their family. His love and devotion for his wife was a testimony of his commitment to her. Breathe, breathe. It's just a eulogy, for Pete's sake. <laughs> Taking more time, sorry. Lena Irene Jansen, her maiden name, Schmidt, went quietly to be with her Lord, same one, on November 26, 2022, at 7.30 a.m. at Salem, Oregon Hospital. She dearly loved her husband and family, serving them faithfully through the years of ministry and home life. I'm trying to keep my voice from sounding like a squirrel, okay? <clears throat> Dad was born on April 30, 1929 in Vernonia, Oregon to Tobias and Agnes Schmidt and two older sisters. All his childhood and youth years were spent in the Dallas area. He enjoyed the location nearby. He played football in high school and graduated from Dallas High in 1947. Mom was born on June 28, 1928. He married an older woman <laughs> in Luster, Montana, to John and Agnes Schmidt. She was the seventh of nine children. She moved from Montana to Oklahoma and then to Dallas when she was 13, graduating from Dallas High in 1946. Bill and Lena were high school <laughs> sweethearts and married on August, can't see, 1949 at Grace Mennonite Church in Dallas. After Bible College in Omaha, Nebraska, they accepted a position as pastor of a church in Spokane, Washington. This led to their ministry of serving as a pastor at a total of seven churches over a span of about 28 years in five different states. They worked together painting golden homes in 1973 and 1974 while they were on a sabbatical for ministry after which they returned to Dallas in 1975 as the owners of Karis Bookstore, enjoying time with family and friends, building relationships old and new. We know that an amazing number of Bibles went out around the world through the store's ministry. They sold the business in 1990 and began their retirement, continuing to serve the Lord until God took them home to heaven. Coin collecting was a favorite hobby of of his, as was being a beekeeper. Some of his favorite activities including fishing, hunting, gardening, having coffee with friends, 
and riding his scooter around town. You all remember that, right? You may have seen him on the, on the corner of Washington and Church Street holding a hair dryer in his hand to assist the police department in traffic control. Anybody? Right? I never saw it, and I probably would have kept driving if I would seen it. <laughs> Lena diligently cared for her children. As a young mom, she was diagnosed with an eye disease that caused eventual blindness. But her main concern was that she would have her sight long enough to see her children be able to care for themselves. She knew God blessed her to be able to see her 13 grandchildren as well as several great-grandchildren. As her sight diminished, listening to books on tape helped fill her days, along with making Swebach often. Did I say it right? Yeah, okay. Completing word search puzzles and playing bingo at Dallas Retirement Village Assisted Living. Their love for their family stems from their relationship with the Lord. They generously gave and served in the community and, and have a, left a legacy for many to carry on. At Dad's passing two and a half years ago, he was preceded in death by his parents. Upon Mom's passing, she was preceded in death by her parents and siblings. The survivors include their five children, Elaine Lawless of Dallas, Jerry and Luann of Nebraska, Judy and Ron. Sorry. There really was a bug there. Ron and Judy Fast of Dallas, Colleen and Kevin Shin of Dallas, and myself, Neil and Chris of Dallas. Also, surviving are 13 grandchildren and nine spouses, 38 great-grandchildren, are you keeping track of this? And two great-great-grandchildren with one on the way. Bill's surviving sisters <clears throat> are Grace Jansen of Dallas and Jewel and Herb Peters of Springfield, Oregon and they have many nieces and nephews. Private family gravesite services were held for them at the Dallas Cemetery. Contributions in honor of Bill and Lena can be made to Weekday School of the Bible, care of the Dallas Mortuary Center at 287 Southwest Washington Street, Dallas, Oregon. That website, if you want it, I'm going to read it once, www.dallastribute.com. Thank you. Looks like they chose the wrong shoes today. <laughs> Good morning. For those of you who don't know, my name is Kiara Fast, and I am one of the great-granddaughters of Bill and Lena Schmidt. Please bear with me as I am losing my voice, because that's the college life. Um, and so if I sound like a full-grown man, I apologize in advance. <laughs> as a little kid, you remember the little things like the way Grandpa always ate a spoonful of peanut butter just about every time we came to visit. Or Grandma's impeccable memory and her ability to talk about everything and anything going on in your life, like the things most people would forget. Or Grandpa handing out all the coins to all the great grandkids and telling us to save them because they'd be worth a lot someday. And even Grandma's smiling eyes every time you come to greet her, the happiness you would feel when she recognized the sound of your voice and immediately reached out for a long hug. Then as you get older, you learn to cherish every hug and every Bible verse spoken, all the hymns sung at Christmas time, and all the constant prayers. In Matthew 5.16, it says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see, see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. As the years went by, I saw more and more clearly the kind of bright light my great-grandparents always carried with them wherever they went. Grandpa always reached out to lovingly guide people back to the Lord, he was honest and kind to those who didn't know Christ, and his compassion was given abundantly to anybody and everybody. I miss the way he would sit in his chair in the living room, talking about books, offering wisdom in a way where you just couldn't stop listening, and the way he held your hand as he reminded you of God's big and beautiful plan for your life whenever you would say your goodbyes. Grandma was quite the prayer warrior. She never forgot the battles that other people were fighting, their silent struggles, and their hopeless hearts. She was the kind of person who, when she said she would pray for you, she always did. Throughout the entirety of my mom's cancer battle, I remember her regular phone calls to my family. She never forgot a doctor's appointment, a chemo treatment, 
an update or a diagnosis. As she consistently filled our hearts with prayer and words of encouragement, God also used her to give my family and I hope and peace in his love and presence. There's a song I heard on the radio right after the passing of my great-grandpa just about two years ago. And it's one that I now realize captures who both my great-grandparents were quite well. The lyrics of the chorus are this. Joy still comes in the morning. Hope still walks with the hurting. If you're still alive and breathing, praise the Lord. Don't stop dancing and dreaming. There's still good news worth repeating. So lift your head and keep singing. Praise the Lord. I, can't, I cannot express just how kind, strong, caring, and selfless my great-grandparents were. I'm grateful that I had the years th with them that I did, even though I wish there were more. What I can express, however, is that they left an amazing story of God's goodness behind for all of us to carry on. Although their stories here on earth ended, they'll always be remembered for their light that still shines today. They love God so much, and because of that, they were able to love others so well. There's not a single doubt in my mind that their unwavering faith changed the hearts of many. I know because it changed mine. I'm sure Grandpa is taking a joy ride up in heaven, no longer needing his little scooter anymore. And I'm almost certain that Grandma is talking it up with all the people and all the angels up there, maybe even playing bingo too. I find peace and comfort knowing that we will see them again, and even more so knowing that this time we will get to spend eternity together. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm just going to read because I'm not going to make it through it without it. <clears throat> my name is Steve. I'm the second oldest uh, of their grandchildren. And uh, my grandparents were the epitome of, of love. Um, whether were, they were upset with us for uh, getting in trouble or whatever, everything they did was with love. Uh, discipline was with love. Everything they did was just how much they loved us. Um, I'm going to read a, a short thing from uh, uh, another grandchild, uh, Jeremy, who can't be here today. <clears throat> Grandpa and Grandma's house. There was a little house on Church Street. We always felt welcome. Grandpa and Grandma's house. There was something about that house that was welcoming and just felt special. It wasn't big or fancy. It didn't have the newest gadgets or technology. It had people. They had love, laughter, and fun. Little things we'd hear, say, and do in that house bring comfort and sweet memories of days gone by. Grandkids or my cousins, any of these things sound familiar? <clears throat> One is, Grandma, is there any ice cream in the deep freeze? <laughs> or Grandpa's fresh <coughs> carrots that we used to pick right out of the uh, garden. <clears throat> Saturdays are for Sweebok, Grandma would say. Sodas in the, in the, are in the garage fridge. Toys under the stairs. And we'd also hide under there when you're in trouble. The king's roost outside by the garage was full of the things that we gathered as grandkids. Uh, sliding down the stairs in sleeping bags. <laughs> sliding down the banister, making sure you stop at the end before you hit it. <laughs> Going to Grandpa and Grandma's house on Christmas Eve to watch Christmas cartoons upstairs and sneak snacks. Frozen berries and nuts in the deep freeze. Uh, Grandpa's uh, stashes of Pringles that, and candies that he hide that we weren't allowed to have, but we'd take them anyways. <laughs> laughter, lots and lots of laughter. Easter egg hunts in the backyard watching movies in the back room at uh, Karis Bookstore where we sneaked the little sugar cubes that Grandpa would have for his coffee. <clears throat> Grandpa showing up randomly on the putt-putt just to say hi. And when we were little kids, he'd spit out his false teeth. <laughs> and we'd grab him. Uh, Grandma's clucking makes everyone cluck. And last but not least, Grandpa getting emotional reading the Christmas story. Uh, Grandma and Grandpa, you gave us hospitality, love, laughter, and a beautiful family to know and experience life together. While we know you had to take your trip to heaven, we'll miss you. But thank, but thank you for what you established in that little greenhouse, for the foundation you helped us with, 
You have indeed lived out a legacy bigger than what you could have dreamed. And it is definitely not goodbye. It's we'll see you later. I'm going to take a very small liberty. Um, since I crossed one name off of here, I, want to, I just want to share one thing. Um, Bill, to me, was my mentor. We spent many times, I was talking to Pastor Ron, Ron and I around his table in the little green house, having lunch and talking about what it meant to pastor and shepherd people and love people. I value those times. And Bill was also the Bible man. Quietly he would come and he would say, do you need any Bibles for camp? And I'm one of his last, uh, last uh, conversations, well, not last conversation, but together with them at their house, they asked me again, do you need Bibles anywhere? And I said, yeah, I'm teaching at Weekday Bible now. And our Bibles are just about worn out at Whitworth. It wasn't long till we had brand new Bibles. And I tell the kids, the kids that are there right now, they really take care of those Bibles, because I tell them that story, and that the Bible man sent his Bibles. So, now I'm getting emotional. <laughs> okay, we better move on to the next song. Trust and obey, trust and obey. Now, we are going to, we are gonna sing the first verse with the chorus, and then we're going to sing the other verses, and then when we get to the last verse, we'll do the chorus again. We're not going to do the chorus every, every verse, okay? And I think that should be how it follows on the screen. So why don't you stand with me? Here we go. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory. sign or a tear and abide while we trust and obey verse 3 not a burden we bear not a sorrow we share but our toil he doth richly repay not a grief nor a loss not a frown I'm Colleen. I'm daughter number four, three, child number four, I guess it is. Um, I am going to read a poem that was one of Dad's favorite, and some of you, if you were here when he pastored, um, you might have heard this a time or two, but it's, um, 
it's a verse that meant a lot to him, has a good message, and, you know, Dad never passed up an, up an opportunity to just, you know, give you a little bit of spiritual boost and get you moving in the right direction. It's called The Dash, and it was written by Linda Ellis. I read of a reverend who stood to speak at the funeral of his friend. He referred to the dates on his tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of his birth and spoke of the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time that he spent alive on earth. And now only those who loved him know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the little greenhouses, <laughs> the cash. What matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left. Could be, you could be at dash mid-range. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and always try to understand the way other people feel and be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read, with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you spent your dash? I'm Jerry, the second oldest. Uh, would you guys hang on a second? I have to go back into town to get my notes, so can you hang on a second? <laughs> no. no. I have become the ball baby in the family. So this is my help right here today. So we'll see how this goes. And my, my siblings said that they're going to shut me off at a certain time. So, Sal Mayan, I'll pay you double what they paid you. Okay. Dear Mom and Dad, I thought Neil's was going to be hard. <clears throat> I'll do the best I can here. My dad told my bride-to-be, Luann, in 1979, after she had just met him the day before our wedding, she was more nervous about meeting them than the wedding itself. And he said to her, don't be nervous, Luann. Pastors put on their pants just like anyone else one leg at a time. And this is how they live their life in front of everyone they met. Family, friends, church family, waitresses at restaurants, employees at the Dollar Tree, at H2O, wherever dad and mom were at, wherever dad, he was just so friendly. Dad and mom didn't want to be put on a pedestal as pastor, pastor's wife, but they wanted to be on ground level with everyone else, being as Christ was in his life. No matter where they were at or who they were with, they were normal people with a lot of faults. Dad and mom weren't afraid to show their love and respect for each other in front of us kids. Many times when we couldn't find them, one of us would remember to go look in the kitchen 
by the refrigerator. And sure enough, we would catch them smooching in the kitchen. And we'd holler out, okay, they're at it again in the kitchen. All, I know all our kids have been touched by grandpa and grandma in some way. All these grandkids here. We have several that came from quite a distance to be, to be with us today. Lisa came from Rapid City. Tracy came from Redmond, crossing over that pass that thankfully didn't have the snow and ice on it. Our son, Aaron, and our son, Jason, and Jason's wife, Ashley, came from Nebraska to be here with us today. Some of them, a lot of the grandkids and great kids are here. Some of them wish they could be here, but can't for some reason. All of them remembering times and places that we'll always treasure with Grandpa and Grandma. And I just want to say that this is an honor to be able to speak a few words about dad and mom for me and my siblings. Being preacher's kids is not a special status for us, but it's a unique position to be in. We got into trouble just as much as any other kid, maybe some of us more than others. But that doesn't change the fact of how good of parents they were. Us kids learn the signs of dad and mom's boiling points. Mom's neck would get red, and we knew we were getting to that point where we were in big trouble, or almost. Dad's eyebrows would rise, saying, don't push me any further, or we'd already gone too far. I, for one, have forgotten the many reasons why we got disciplined individually, or as a group. If it was my fault for getting lined up, getting us all lined up and disciplined together, well, I just have to thank you, brothers and sisters, <laughs> for standing with me all those times that we were together. Sure, no problem. <laughs> thank you. One time does really stand out for me about discipline and love combined. It was when we were in North Dakota and I had been out with some friends till way past curfew. I parked the car and walked toward the open garage door to go in the house. As I walked in the garage, I could see someone sitting on the steps by the utility door in the dark. And I had a sinking feeling in my stomach and I knew I was in big trouble for staying out way past curfew. I slowly walked through the garage up to I knew who I knew was dad sitting on the steps. To this day, I will never forget the first words he said to me. Jerry, you know that your mom and I love you very much. You know, and I don't even remember what he said to me after that. I don't even know what kind of punishment I might have got. I'm sure I deserved it for whatever it was. And you know, all of us kids, no matter what age, we need to learn that actions have consequences, don't they? By the way, I didn't get spanked, but that's one spanking that I felt more than any of all the other spankings we got, individually or as a group. All of us kids are very grateful for the closeness and the special bond that our parents instilled in us as kids. And you know, we have a special bond right now to this day, even though my wife and I and our family live in Nebraska, but yet it's, we're so close together is with my family, my siblings. And when we come out here, it's, it's just so fantastic to know that we are, and all the grandkids, we're just so close. 
And I really pray that our kids, grandkids, grandkids, great grandkids of mom and dad, that they will continue to do the same thing. Have that special bond with one another. And you know, like in any relationship, it takes work. It takes tough love. And most of all, lots of prayer, doesn't it? Whenever we had an issue or a disagreement with someone, Dad would tell us, keep your accounts short. Or like in Ephesians 4.26, don't let the sun go down in your anger. And I'm going to add just a little bit to that. Lord, if you forgive me for this. Or you're hurt. It doesn't always take anger, but sometimes there's hurt. And Dad lived that, didn't he? Dad Mom's ministry was so much more than being a pastor dad and a pastor's wife and mother. Mom was the glue for us kids when Dad was gone. She had so much patience with five sweet, lovable, and adorable children to take care of. Ha. <laughs> Dad's passion was also teacher, counselor, mentor, motivator. When someone had a need, Dad would tell us, and I don't know who mentioned this before, but he would always tell us he had to go see a man about a dog. But he rarely came home with a dog. <laughs> Years later, I realized that Dad had a mission to intercede for or to help someone in need. And he was committed to keeping these needs confidential, and people came to trust him because of that. We know now a lot of people's lives have been touched and changed by those missions. And I'll bet there are people here today who have been touched by God's hand through Pastor Bill. The preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of his death and resurrection for all mankind, began in our home, and then it went to extended family as it grew. Friends, church family, and the world. For mom and dad, became a natural thing for them to want to spread the gospel, the gospel message too. The Karis Bookstore is a prime example of the outreach dad and mom had. Mom enjoyed the bookstore as much as dad did, and their ministry there together complimented them so much as a team. Dad liked to make learning about Jesus fun and exciting for kids. Here's a slide of a couple tools Dad used to teach stories in DVBS at camps and Sunday school. Anybody remember the names? Mick and Monk. Mick and Monk. Um, I remember when we found these in Mom and Dad upstairs and Dad's stuff when we went through the house several years ago, I put my hands in there like I did as a kid. But um, this time I remembered the staples that <laughs> held them together. <laughs> I had to be careful how I did it, but. <laughs> but Dad used those a lot, didn't he? Anybody else remember these? Good, it's cool. One of the things Dad liked to do for Sunday school evening services in North Dakota was to do Bible drills. One passage he sprung on us one time in the evening was found in Hezekiah. That's in the Old Testament, if you don't know. Does anyone know Hezekiah 4.6? I do. Oh, okay. He that sitteth on a tack shall surely rise again and say great and mighty things which thou knowest not. <laughs> That's the only verse I know of in Bill's modified version, just so you know. And our family can remember the many songs he made up. You may also hear, hear songs he made up. But then he couldn't remember them to sing them again. He was pretty good at that. All of us could tell many stories about Bill and Lena. 
I'm going to let you do that after the service with one another. And I'm going to do this last part. Because I want to. Dad, Mom, for many of us, it's because of your life example that we will be with you in heaven someday. And we need to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you. I'm, I'm Judy Fast, their middle daughter, middle child. And I'd like to say that all the songs that we sung today, they mentioned them to us many times and asked us to sing them at their memorial. I'm going to play one verse, if I can, on the piano of another of their favorite songs, Great Is Thy Faithfulness. I'm going to play one verse, and then I'd like to ask you to sing that verse with me afterwards. It's not the squirrel in my throat I'm concerned about, it's the frog. <laughs> and I want you to know, I left my Amplified Bible at home because of time, but I did bring my chain reference Bible, all right? So, I would encourage you, uh, Try to listen as closely as you can. What I have to share are words, first of all, that I, I trust will bring you uh, encouragement and hope and peace in the sorrowful days that we walk with our memories. Uh, we've had to say goodbye, but like was mentioned, it's not a forever goodbye. It's just till we, well, as Roy Rogers used to sing, till we meet again, 
right? And uh, I, I saw that little word hope back there, and I, I don't know, in some ways I thought maybe we should have had it blown up real big as big as these, because there's every reason to be gathered here with hope. Bill and Lena were married, as mentioned in the eulogy by Neil, 70 years, and 28 of those years, Bill served as pastor at a total of seven different churches. That means, of course, that Lena was not just a wife for 70 years, but a pastor's wife as well. It's not easy to be a pastor's wife, and it's not easy to be a pastor's family. You're under the scrutiny of the congregants and the community. I take my own beautiful bribe. How many times did she look at me as being a pastor? And even this morning, I hate to admit it, but straighten my collar out. <laughs> Make sure my hair was in place. And while Dad was up here preaching, she was back there in the pew, not with a, quite as many as a Schmidt household family had, but fidgeting children just as well. And she, my, my wife, as I'm sure Lena was with Bill, was reminding him of important things that we guys just overlook or forget. You see, the task of pastoring is more than, than a man behind the pulpit. It is a family that's sacrificing time with dad so he might serve the flock under his care. I wonder how many crises did your dad respond to? How many hospital visits did he make? How many cups of coffee did he drink so that he could encourage and counsel or just listen? How many hours were spent in ser sermon prep time that took him away from the family? Time that mom had to cover. As was mentioned, and I, I don't know if you could tell me, but how many times did you hear him say, I have to go see a man about a dog? <laughs> Bill's ministry took him from North Dakota to Oregon, and if pastoring isn't hard enough, you know, I can't imagine what it'd be like to pastor in North Dakota where the temperatures go well below freezing and snow drifts pile high against fence lines. And later when Bill and Lena opened the Karis bookstore in Dallas, Bill often could be found in the back room being a pastor's pastor. As any number of us local ministers would stop by for counsel or words of encouragement on ministry matters. And while we sat in the back room with Bill, guess who was manning the store? Even after they sold the store, Bill continued his involvement in ministry, leading a men's Bible study of which I was a part. And he joined other men regularly at Burger King for coffee not just to solve the world's problems, but to encourage us to persevere in the faith. So I guess the saying that I've heard is true. Once a pastor, always a pastor. It is a calling for life. But I might add this, once a pastor's wife, always a pastor's wife. I found a poem online, and, and I'd like to share it, uh, but I've modified it to make it a little more personal. I hope the author of the poem uh, is okay with this. It takes a special person to be a pastor's wife, for it is not an easy task or a simple way of life. The phone often rings at dinner time. <clears throat> Vacations, they are few. With so many needs in the church, there's always lots to do. When people need a helping hand, on you they can depend. For you always try your best to be a faithful friend. You, Lena, you, Lena, were a pastor's wife, but I hope that you did know God gave you as a gift to Bill, but us, the church also. 
What a perfect helpmate Lena, I think, was for Bill. The scripture says an excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of his life. Proverbs chapter 31. Well, Mary Jo and I followed Bill and Lena here at Bridgeport in ministry. And I was one of those who spent many sessions with him in conversation. I might add, he is the one who did our marriage counseling back in 1988. In my times of visiting with him, he would have scripture to share with me, such as Hebrews 11:6 and the importance of faith. And then Proverbs chapter three, five and six, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not unto your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And he would help me keep focus when my attention was getting scattered by basic rules to live by, summed up as a friend just reminded me the other day, his seven rules to live by, of which included daily audibly Ron, remind yourself of your commitment to God, because it's easy to forget that. Or confess your sins, keeping short accounts. And always alongside, Lena was there as support and helper, wife and fellow servant of the Lord. How thankful I am that Lena was willing to allow him to continue serving as a pastor's pastor. You know, I often visited Bill and Lena in the greenhouse on Court Street. How many of you have been in the greenhouse on Court Street? Yeah, and the beautiful rose garden in the backyard? Great. Well, one time when I was visiting there, they introduced me to one of their newest friends. Who is she? Yeah, she, Alexis. <laughs> huh? You could ask Alexis anything. She was so smart. Alexis, who was the fifth president of the United States? Alexis, what is the temperature in downtown Dallas? Alexa, how far is it from the moon to the earth? But like I said, you could ask her almost anything and get an answer. But then I asked Bill, I said, Bill, why don't you ask Alexis, who is God? Have you asked her that? Alexis, who is God? And you know what she said? Exactly, nothing. She didn't, in that time frame that I'm talking about, didn't have an answer. And then I thought, maybe, and if you have Alexis in your home or Google, go home and ask him. Alexis. Where is heaven? And how does one get to heaven? You see, there are certain things technology can't answer because technology doesn't have a soul, so it doesn't ask those questions. But we do, especially at a time like this, when we're confronted by our mortality. If you would like to know the answer to those questions, of eternal life and of heaven, I would encourage you to turn to God's word. It is there that we find answers for such questions. It is there where we find the reason for Christmas. You know Christmas is only, well, not 25 days away. It's not even 25 days away. Get your shopping in, all right? But you know, we call Christmas the Advent season, don't we? You know what Advent means? It means coming. It speaks of the coming of Christ born in Bethlehem to die for our sins that we might be born again unto eternal life. Let me be honest with you guys. We're not gonna live forever. And the most dreaded, the, the most dreaded thing we face is not old age. It's not COVID. It's not cancer. It is sin.
And the reason sin is so deadly, because it leads to eternal death. It leads to a separation from God. But Jesus Christ, Advent, why did he come? Why did this one leave heaven, leave his Father in heaven? Why did he come down and take upon himself humanity? He came to die for our sin, that the curse of sin, that eternal death might be removed from us. Listen to the words of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 53. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. And Peter, writing in his first letter, 1 Peter chapter 2, says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Alexis, Alexis, wake up over there. I can hear that. Lena saying to Alexis, Alexis. Ask Alexis this. Alexis, do you know how a sinner, of which I am and you are, do you know how a sinner can be healed from the curse of sin? Ask her that. Listen to what she would say. I don't know if she would say anything. But you know what God says? If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes and is justified and with the mouth man confesses and is saved. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be healed, shall be saved shall have eternal life. <laughs> what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins, all our sins, all our sins. Incredible, yeah. But that's the power of God working. Don't underestimate it. The blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross is powerful enough to justify you if you will but come to him and confess that he died for you. It is through Jesus Christ that a sinner receives forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life. Referring again to Peter's writing, I would leave you with some words here. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, into an inheritance, into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Through faith, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation, ready to be revealed at the last day. Christ gives us what? Not a wishful hope. What did Peter say? If you know Jesus Christ, you are here at a memorial service where we are remembering Bill and Lena who have departed from us, but we have a living hope. Not a wishful hope, not a dead hope, a living hope. That like Christ, we will be raised from the dead, we will be taken to heaven, we will receive an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Best of all, we will forever dwell in the presence of God's glory, where death, sorrow, and suffering will be no more. You know, one of Bill's hobbies, as was mentioned, was being a beekeeper. How many of you like honey? You like honey? I like honey. I love honey. I like the bees' honey. I don't like the bees' sting. How many of you like the bees' sting? Probably not too many of us. I wonder how many times my good friend Bill might have gotten stung. You know, yeah, you know, death, death has a sting to it. The sting is separation. 
separation of one from another. So I love you, your mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, great grandma and great grandpa, great great grandma and grandpa. <laughs> oh, I mean, just like my brother Steve. I mean, they meant a lot to so many of us. Thank you for sharing them. There's a sting in that separation. A sting because of the memories that I will no longer have. Death does have a sting. At a time like this, gathered with our memories, whatever your memories might be, and I encourage you to share those memories one with another, it doesn't take away the sting. If all I have are memories to live with, and, and, and if all there is, as the song says, this circle of life, you know, just being part of a circle of life, that I'm here today and I'm gone tomorrow. I mean, think about your life. Think about Bill and Lynn. They've left us. That hurts. Someday I'll leave you. It may hurt. People will leave you. It'll hurt. And, and all there is is a circle of life. So ultimately it just gets swept away like dust in history, forgotten. What, what takes away this sting? It's, it's as Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's empty. Life is vain. It's empty. But Christ came to reveal that there's more to our being here today and here today, gone tomorrow. There is an eternity ahead for those who will put their faith and trust in him. A day when we shall be together again with all God's people in heaven. As the scripture says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. Thanks be to God, who gives victory, victory through Jesus Christ. That's the hope. And so the sting is removed as I think about Bill and Lena, because I live with the hope, a living hope. Even as I face my own mortality, I live with a hope, a living hope. that to be dead in the body is to be alive with the Lord. That death is not the end. The grave where you put mom this morning before you got here is not the end of where she is. Oh yeah, that's the fleshly body, but her life, her soul, her presence is with Jesus. Hallelujah. Waiting the day of resurrection. And so friends, this is a day to think about life. Okay? Even though it's a memorial service, it's a day to think about life. It's a day to think about the life of your soul. As you remember the, the life of Bill and Lena, don't let it be mere hollow memories, but find the great living hope that's in Jesus Christ, a hope unto eternal life in heaven. What a day that will be when as followers of Jesus Christ, we get to heaven. Before my brother comes to lead us in another song that we all close with, just before the closing prayer, let me read the first verse to you. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace in his mansions bright and blessed. He'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Hallelujah. May you have that living hope, friend, as you go through this day and all the days of your life. Amen.
Wow, I want to sing. So why don't you stand and join me for this final song, When We All Get to Heaven, a song of celebration. And the verses are also songs of exhortation to trust Him and serve Him every day of your life. So let's sing this last song together. seated and uh, I'm going to close with prayer. After I finished praying, uh, the family, we are asking the family to usher themselves out uh, into the reception area for a light lunch. And then after they are out, the ushers will come and dismiss you by your rows uh, and let you go over to fellowship and visit with them and share memories one with another. So uh, please, uh, for all of us visitors with the family, let us remain here till the family has been uh, dismissed and then uh, we'll be ushered out. Let us pray. Father, I thank you in times like this that I can think not only about the memories, beautiful memories, God, but there is a hurt I can't go sit in Lena's room anymore at the DRV and have that sweetness, God, that I've enjoyed so many years with her and previously with Bill and Lena. But thank you, Father, that I do have something to look forward to. You've given, you've given me and so many of us here a living hope. Thank you for the healing that you have provided for my sinful life through Jesus Christ. And for the wholeness and health, Father, that you have brought to me, that I can look forward that where Bill and Lena, my mom and dad, and so many, so many of the saints have gone, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Father, someday will be with all of your family there in heaven. So thank you, Father. 
Thank you for giving life beyond the grave meaning. I just would ask, Father, you speak to any here that perhaps have yet to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ to speak into their lives. Let them hear your spirit, Father, declare the truth that you sent your only son into the world to save sinners and that they are welcome to come, to come home because Christ is the way. Thank you for the time to remember. Thank you for the refreshments that we'll be able to partake of as we join together. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. sins and griefs to bear Oh, what a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer Oh, what peace we often for Oh, what needless pain we bear And all because we do not care Everything to God in prayer
find a friend so faithful Who will all our sorrows bear Jesus knows our every weakness Take it to
by your side I can only imagine What my eyes will see When your face Is before me I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine I can only imagine I can only imagine When that day comes And I find myself Standing in the sun I can only imagine When all I would do Is forever Forever worship you I can only imagine, yeah I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall, will I sing hallelujah, will I be able to speak at all, I can only imagine, yeah, I can only imagine. You'll get lost But the three little fishes Didn't want to be bossed So the three little fishes Went off on a spree And they swam and they swam Right out to the sea Singing boop boop Did them dad and why don't you Boop boop 
dear dad, why don't you? Boop, boop, dear dad, why don't you? And he swam, and he swam all over the dam. Here's a lot of fun. We're gonna swim in the sea till the day is done. So they swam and they swam and it was a lark. Till all of a sudden they saw a shark. Boop, boop, did him, dad, and why don't you? Boop, boop, did him, dad, and why don't you? Boop, boop, did him, dad, and why don't you? And they swam and they swam all over the dam. Cried the little fishes, look at the whale. Then quick as they could, they turned on their tails. So back to the pool in the meadow they swam, and they swam and they swam back over the dam. Singing boop boop, did em dad, why don't you? Boop boop, did em dad, why don't you? Boop boop, did em dad, why don't you? And they swam and they swam all over the dam. Yes, they swam and they swam. All over the dam, they swam and they swam all over the dam. Tired of just chick chick, so one morning he started to say, Chickery chick, chala chala. What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh. Our sins and griefs to bear. Oh, what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often for. Oh, what needless pain we bear And all because we do not care Everything to God in prayer 